Okay, Doug. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're going to start the next session now. Um, so our first speakers um, are from St George's Hospital. So we've got Zef Vanden and Paolo Valeros who are going to talk to us um, about echocardiography and inherited cardiomyopathies. So welcome to Zef and Paolo. We're looking forward to your talk. Um, we will bring you on screen now. Hello, hello. hello. <laughs> Hi, Zef. Welcome. Um, so if you could share your slides whenever you're ready. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK. Can everybody see my screen? We can. Oh, brilliant. OK, great. Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can everybody see that? Are they fine? Yes. All good. OK, um, so uh, first I'd like to thank uh, um, the organizers, uh, the fellow, uh, our fellow presenters, um, our excellent chairs, uh, Brian and Amanda, and of course yourselves for joining us. It's, it's really humbling to be amongst such a knowledgeable group uh, and it's kind of scary as well. Uh, so um, today I'm going to be presenting, um, going through this short session on echo in the ICC setting. Um, for any cl clinician working uh, in ICC, understanding echo is an, a cornerstone to a practice. And many of you may not be performing the scans yourselves, but hopefully you will re be reviewing and interrogating these scans regularly. So I hope to today's humble physiologist perspective will be of uh, some use. All right, so, um, so we won't be doing a comprehensive review today. So in the next 15 minutes, we'll be just be doing a, uh, a uh, very rough guide uh, of some extremely bite-sized takeaway, little things that hopefully we can help, that can help you when you're uh, faced with one of these challenging cases. So just a quick rundown of some of the basics we need before echo. So before, before echo, quality echo is absolutely dependent on detailed indications, including previous investigations, symptoms, medications, or suspicions to give us a clue as to what to pay a particular attention to as a physiologist. And of course, uh, during the most important, uh, the, the most important thing is a full BSC data set of high quality images in a, with a systematic approach with careful measurements. But in addition to that, we need a uh, very uh, uh, focus on cardiomyopathy pathology. So careful wall thickness measurements exclu with exclusion of trabeculation, exclusion of RV component. Uh, we need imaging uh, in the short and long axis views at many levels. So that means even in the parastonal long axis view, taking a, a low parastonal long axis view so we can see all the way to the apex, um, modified parastonal views and a, a, a focus on the RV from all views, no matter what pathology you're looking at. And um, in addition, looking at mitral leaflet morphology, including cordae, SAM, cavity gradients, and of course, provocation. In addition, um, we're, everybody's using strain now, and that should be part of all of our daily use. Um, um, in addition, there's uh, new, newer modalities, 3D multi-slice imaging, which I'm finding quite useful. Um, and of course, after a, keep a, a detailed and careful report, uh, but one of the most important things is the breakfast of champions feedback. So if you, if you have good, bad MRI agreement or disagreement, feed that back to the physiologist and you'll get better results in future. Um, OK, so you'll be happy to know this is the last slide with just words. We're on to the picture books from now on. Um, it's just going to be echo images. So the biggest challenge in echo is um, is is to be able to, to measure the true myocardium. Um, and, and to differentiate what is RV component, what is trabeculation, and what is fresh air. So if, if we were faced with this measurement, Paolo isn't today here today, but if I was to ask him, he, he might say uh, that, uh, that this might be a bit of an overestimation, and maybe we need to have a closer look at the myocardium. So if we look here, we can see that indeed, there is quite a lot of fresh air in that previous measurement, and indeed the measurement is entirely normal. 
So uh, in addition, it can be help, very helpful to look in the short axis view. Sometimes things become apparent there. So here, overestimated, obviously. Now, this sounds like I might be trying to teach everybody to suck eggs, but it's obvious it's, it's a basic and something that we often get uh, we often can get wrong. So uh, it's something we're often very paranoid about is is are we doing these measurements correctly? Um, so here's a test. Is there hypertrophy here in this? Is there ventricular hypertrophy? Um, if you said yes, uh, is it asymmetrical? If you said it's asymmetrical, then you'd be right. We can see that there's actually uh, uh, a, a uh, separation of that posterior wall. So that is actually a normal wall. Um, but uh, there's an additional thing we've been tricked. There's actually there's more to it, as there always is an echo. Um, we've been tricked by this that patient's pathology. Actually, in addition to the asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, they also have uh, hypertrophy of the RV free wall, which you can see is actually very obvious when you're told it's there. Um, and in addition to that, something that we should always look out for is RV outflow tract obstruction. We can see that this, this hypertrophy of the right ventricle is actually causing uh, the right ventricle to become obstructive. And so that's 64 millimeters of mercury at rest, quite significant and important uh, clinically. So uh, that brings us on to echo snack number two. Can we see any abnormalities in this one? Now, I, I think um, we, we might say, if you said, well, the papillary muscles look a little bit chunky and maybe the apex is uh, is, a, a, is is obliterating a little bit. Um, maybe you'd say, you'd say maybe I want to see some more views or imaging is needed. So um, if we do a parasternal long axis view, but take the probe down a couple of centimeters or rib spaces, we can notice that we have the um, the very prominent apicalized papillary muscle here, and uh, that's not even as prominent as it would be in the apical three chamber view. And indeed, the apex here is quite chunky. It's 1.3 centimeters, so it's a hypertrophied apex. Now, um, 3D echo, it looks pretty, and it can actually be of use here. We can see that we can very uh, get a very uh, nice representation of all the hypertrophy all the way to the apex. And confirmation here we have the uh, bullseye strain pattern and a low overall GLS of 13%. Um, so, uh, echo snack number two this is a young lady with global T wave inversions. Oh, and uh, here we go. Um, I got a young lady with global T wave inversions. Can we notice anything abnormal here? It's a bit hard to tell. Um, we're very used to looking at apical hypertrophy and septal hypertrophy, but we're often finding these cases that are often missed. Uh, we can see that this lady actually has a inferior wall and inferior septum of well, up to 1.5 centimeters. Um, so that brings us to uh, mini echo snack number three. Often the most notable abnormality uh, might is often no, noticed first in the papillary muscle, like our, uh, the case two, two cases ago, particularly um, if it's hypertrophied and extending to the apex. So we can see this one looks quite suspicious here. And if we go down a rib space, we can actually um, get an answer straight from the second image. And in, in this case, we can see the extent of the papillary uh, muscle hypertrophy and even uh, the maybe some ap apical hypertrophy. Um, and of course, a strain map to confirm this as apical hypertrophy. That brings us to uh, the mitral valve and systolic anterior motion. Um, so in this case, we can see there's very notable septal hypertrophy and complete systolic anterior motion um, with, uh, with a long contact time on M mode. Um, and leading to aortic valve closure. So when I, I, I'm guessing that not many of us are putting the the uh, the M mode through the aortic valve, but it is quite useful in these cases. If we go to the apicals on this same patient, um, we can see only mild regurgitation. Uh, and here we can see a gradient um, at rest of 11 millimeters mercury and only 20 millimeters uh, mercury on Valsalva, but as uh, Dr. Antonis and 
and, and Dr. Tomei Esteban presented previously, it's essential to replicate physiological stresses of uh, daily activities uh, to help to try and unmask radiants. So even asking this patient to stand up straight uh, and measuring his heart whilst he is standing, uh, we can see we're getting a, a very significant gradient of 68 millimeters mercury. And if we ask the uh, patient to do some squats to seven squats uh, and measure their gradient while they're upright, we can see it rises again. Um, OK, so here we have a, a, a echo case number five. So we've got marked HCM here. It, and I find these ones, that even though they, it, it's quite, we know that the dimensions of thickness of the walls is quite a, an important par parameter prognostically for the patient, but it's extremely challenging to measure this, to be able to exclude the right ventricular component. But it, it obviously has to be attempted. And that's because of many reasons, um, very dense trabeculation, off-axis imaging in this case, um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and a large RV component. But here we've got attempts at the measurements and it's only by measuring that you get better at doing this, but it's something that's still agonizing as a physiologist. So um, this moves on to the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. Um, so new RVBSC guidelines are, are much more generous and now uh, differ quite differ quite a bit from the task force guidelines. Um, and we do know that uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is a biventricular process. So what do we think about um, this case here? So this, this is a young man with um, uh, a history of chest pain, anterior T-wave inversions, and a previously normal MRI. Now, to me, it all looks pretty normal, except maybe the free wall, uh, the inferior free wall of uh, uh, from the short axis view. What do we, I, I don't know what you think. Probably the answer is, of course, we need more views and more imaging. So if we go for a really systematic and focused approach, we can see here, uh, looking at the RV from here, from, from the parasternal long axis view, from the RV inflow view. And we can see from the measurements here that uh, RVO T1 is slightly dilated at 3.8 centimeters, and he's got a normal free wall strain. So what do we need? I think we need off axis, some, some, some additional imaging. And sometimes that means uh, going off piste, off axis, to look for things if if you if you have a suspicion. So with this chap, we can see that from the apicals, if you if you open up the aortic valve, you can see the RV free wall is moving a little bit odd. The movement is a little bit strange. And if you move to if you go to the subcostal view and go off axis, we can see that indeed it is a small aneurysmal region that's really only notable from this view. Um, so. And, and quite clinically important. I think he went on to have an MRI that did show that region indeed. So, um, so uh, for the next case, I wanted to show um, some more standard and non-standard views in the assessment of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Um, from a deeper uh, parasternal long axis view, we can actually appreciate an area of akinesis at the RV apex that's not really seen from any other, uh, or that particular segment is not seen from any other view. So I think it's quite some, something that's, that's, that's certainly, I found very useful. And here we can see uh, from the RV inflow view that the, anter the anterior portion of the RV free wall is actually moving quite well, uh, where the, inferior aspect is moving less. And you can see that akinesis here uh, of the inferior RV free wall from the mid, -ax mid short axis view here. And indeed, if you look here from the apical views, uh, the eagle eyed amongst you might see something at that RV apex, uh, which is now visible. Now uh, we've seen it as obviously a, a, a clot. Um, uh, so it, it's an, another stroke for uh, going from several views. All right, so uh, on to, so, uh, what I mean? so here we have a view from the parasternal long axis view of a, a, a patient with suspected ARVC. 
Uh, and if we lower and get a wider plax view, we can notice that that inferior lateral wall here is actually akinetic along with the dilated RV here. Um, so indeed, as Gerardo Finocchiaro was saying, it is a biventricular process and uh, often we get our first uh, indications from parasternal uh, long axis view. That brings me on to DCM. So uh, dilated cardiomyopathies. So there's not much to be said for this. But we, we do something that's changed the lives of physiologists uh, assessing these is the new BSC reference ranges. Um, the upper limit of normal is now uh, 5.6 and as we get past 5.7 that's, that's that's dilated. So and we're using and and so we're, we've got a lot more patients with dilated LVs from uh, dimension. But when we've been moving on to indexing, which seems to help with that or conflict a lot. Um, and then also the rise of 3D, uh, order, uh, 3D LVF and automated L, um, uh, LV ejection fraction estimate. So uh, here we've got a case. So with out of the way, I, I wanted to highlight a particular problem that we see with very large LVs. So here we've got a, a chap with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and there's a particular problem that with with large left ventricles is that they often that often uh, off uh, some images can look like they're lovely and on axis um, when in fact they're quite foreshortened. And in this case, uh, if you these images though they look quite nice, uh, it's actually hiding a uh, a huge part of the LV that was missing from these images. Um, so, and in this case, obviously there's a thrombus at the apex. Um, but uh, this is a particular problem with very dilated uh, uh, left ventricles: is uh, that uh, is is that they're quite easy to foreshorten. So you need to, you need to take ask the patient to take a very deep breath and take images further and more laterally. It might also be that uh, you know if if you don't believe the ejection fraction, maybe suspect that it might be a foreshortened image. So. Um, 3D, uh, uh, 3D echo and 3D ejection fraction has the benefit of reducing the risk of excluding the apex. And that's a great way to fact check your Simpsons biplane measurement and it looks neat. So you might want to ask your uh, echocardiographer if they can get a 3D ejection fraction as well. That can help. Obviously, this is not the chap in the previous slide. All right, so uh, to finalize, I wanted to uh, go over, uh, present a patient uh, who came to us with dilated chambers uh, and an ejection fraction of 49%. And he was a, a very active uh, recreational athlete. And to help with this, we have the findings from Lynn Miller's excellent study in 2019 on exercise echo, which can help to differ differentiate this cohort of, of extremely uh, sporty individuals with dilated LVs and low EFs. And so when uh, we uh, here's his images again and when we did uh, the um, took his stress images his left ventricular ejection fraction rose by 16 percent uh, which is well above the 11 percent that Lynn's research would uh, suggest uh, that it, 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 it that it would be normal so um, it's actually a, a very useful tool that we use frequently in the clinic um, with these sporty individuals and with suspicious histories. I think I'm almost out of time. Um, I, I won't even conclude. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to give this uh, short talk. Thank you very much for listening um, and I, I can't wait to hear the next uh, speakers.